Hey, and welcome back to the Kingsway Podcast. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. Jumping back into another episode of The Chosen. And I got to say this one. You said it at the end. I think this is my favorite. It, and I know, I know. I know. We get it. I've said that a lot. <laughs> this one is definitely to my favorite. To this point. Yeah. To this point. What you've seen. This is your yeah. favorite. I'll tell you. Pretty much one one part. There's so many, so many, so many good this things. Is this is such episode. a cool thing that we get to do because we're talking through episodes. I feel like the last yeah. two episodes we've talked through have been fillers, a little less to talk about yeah. detail wise. This gives Still you great, everything yeah. you wanted. Yeah. In some of those others. And yeah. just so you know, there are spoilers in this. We're gonna talk specifics. So if you haven't mm-hmm. or you're joining us in this journey, hopefully yeah. you just watched it or you're you're familiar with what we're gonna talk about. Because I want to just jump right in. So Ryan. Yep. So there's a character in the Gospels called Simon the Zealot. And I remember hearing that name and thinking, this guy's just dedicated. And then I remember being in Bible college and them talking about major, major groups and like movements within Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. I learned a little bit more about him. And that was cool. Gave some background. This, I feel like um, when I was in high school, I I had a teacher, an English teacher, make us go through Romeo and Juliet. But he was an ex-Navy submarine mechanic, gruff-looking dude, and he was like, I love Romeo and Juliet. And I was like, what is this? And he was like, yeah, you know why I love it? Because it's full of, and he didn't say kissing or romance, he said, it's full of sword fights, poison, deception, war. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I love those things. <laughs> and uh, or at least I did in high school. Um, and so it felt like this episode did that. Yep. For Simon the Zealot's character. I feel like we don't hear a ton about him. He's one of the disciples, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. I want to be sure. Um, I feel like it did that for him. Yeah. Where it was somebody who you didn't think about a lot. Maybe you learned about who Zealots were. And you're like, okay, that's kind of cool. Kind of interesting. Kind of. But this episode really brought it well, to life. And it's one of the best intros, I think, of the whole series yeah. so far. Because it takes yeah. it takes its sweet time at the beginning I would say indoctrinating you into this family story, into Simon's story, uh, into Jesse's story, the other brother, uh, Simon and Jesse are brothers, and it just has this like... Well, they're stepbrothers. Yes. Yeah. And so it's this crazy like, yeah, brokenness, uh, and I love the, you know, we're going to get to a bunch of this, but Simon and Jesse have this great conversation as adults where Jesse is basically saying, you don't know my pain, and Simon's going, I have a different kind of pain. It may yeah. not be physical, but you yeah. know, we all have pain that we're dealing with. I thought artistically this, the intro alone, did a great job of helping you feel what it was like being a crippled person in um, I thought I could use this to, to talk about John 5, which is where this story uh, is recorded and the, the, the pool of Bathsheba. Bes- Beth- Bethsaida? Bethsaida. That sounds say right, Bathsheba. and I'm going to say it Bethsaida. Until it's Bethsaida. Bethsaida. And uh, I really, yeah, there's so many yeah. cool details. I, I don't even know how to, like, capture this whole thing. And I, I will say, it was definitely, this is definitely the same time or third time I think I've watched this episode. It is the one I've nerded out the most on. Yeah. I happened to be preaching on the Festival of the Tabernacles in John when I first watched this. So I was like learning all about what this was like, why they did it, hearing it, watching Nathan, the brand new guy that's in, get to build a tabernacle. Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Sorry. Yep. Nathan. Nathaniel. Yeah. The, and, the disciple. And, yep. uh, you know, watching him be used by Jesus almost immediately to do the thing that he'd wanted yeah. to do. His whole life. So um, it's that that scene with Nathaniel. I thought, I mean, scene is is a couple scenes, but it was so cool because he was he was heartbroken when Jesus called him in the last episode or two two ago. I think um, he wanted his his like dream in life was to build a synagogue and and by building it, like like let building it be an act of worship to God. Mm-hmm let the building itself be dedicated to God, be a place where people could, I think he specifically said, I want to make a place where people can come and pray Mm -hmm. or something like that, where they can come and pray and feel close to God. And so he, he was found by Jesus um, because of Philip in episode two, one or two of Mm -hmm. of this season. And he's been with them for a couple days. And then the feast of tabernacles, you see him doing that. Yep. When he was at his lowest, he burned his plans for the temple because he was like, God, after yep. this construction mishap, I'm over. I'm done with. 
Yep. But now he's back. Yeah. God's and utilizing him in a powerful way. Jesus is God. Jesus is using him mm-hmm. for what he feel like God called him to. God is using him for that. Absolutely. And it's and it's really it's it's cool. It's just a fun moment where it it feels like some of those not in the weeds, but some of those episodes where you got background of the character. This episode felt like you got some like some payoff with all that stuff. Yeah. There's like these small moments where like the characters are being flushed out in a really cool and powerful way yeah. from some of the other episodes. And you can tell a lot of the characters feel proud when they get to use what their skill was for mm. the group. Mm. So like Yeah. Yeah. And it's you can see you can see that when Nathaniel's like complimented by Jesus at the yeah. end, he's like, "You did this. This is a great job." Yeah. And Nathaniel's almost like a child being like told yeah. by a parent, "Like, you did good, kid." You know, and he's yeah. like, "Thanks, Dad." You know, like that type yeah. of moment. Um, and I mean, those are as powerful as those moments are. Th- there's just so many cool things that happen through this episode. But I mean, I really want to talk about the meat of what happens because obviously before we get there, can I say one last thing? Yeah, yeah, go okay. ahead. Nathaniel building the tabernacle, whatever. Yeah, the, the tent, the tabernacle. Yes, feast. yes. So feast of tabernacles is you wander through the desert, remembering you're wandering through the desert. So it's tents or it's booths. Mm-hmm. Tent is a tent. A mm-hmm. booth is like a temporary shelter that's not cloth, or at yep. least not as much cloth and a little more structure and whatever. Anyway. Um, so he's building this using his gift of architecture for Jesus. Yeah. But theologically, Jesus, after he dies and is resurrected and ascends, he goes to say, I'm preparing a place for you. And that, that meant a lot. That's He's a carpenter. Yeah. In their day and age, it meant I'm going back to my father's house. I'm building a room onto it for us to live in. Mm-hmm. And when that room is done, you oh. can come and live with me and we'll be together kind of marriage language but like you just build on your parents house Mm -hmm. and whatever so nathaniel is doing this for the same jesus who promises to go and do that for us Mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily literal what he's just meaning is we're going to live with god yeah in a place god built in a perfect loving relationship well and they have that that powerful conversation around there where he's uh you know big james is asking the question about zachariah where he's like zachariah seems to prophesy that everyone's going to get to come to this house to this space to this thing and and jesus is doing such a great job of like not lying or deceiving in any way but just pointing out if that's going to happen it's going to take a lot of change Mm -hmm. you know things are going to have to really change and and then everyone starts going like, "What could possibly happen that would yeah. make that happen? Like, how big of you know?" And yeah. Like Jesus is not over there like winking behind his cup, but you could just see him like drinking. He's like, "Yeah, I wonder what's gonna happen." Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's when when Nathaniel did this, like, like knowing what's coming, knowing what Jesus has planned for all of creation, and then Nathaniel building this little, it's beautiful, but it's small tabernacle for them. It reminds me of. Mary being like talking in the campfire episode, yeah. you know, he, he, he came and he's God and he's the Messiah. Well, I don't know if she said he's God, but he's the Messiah. He's come to save all humanity. But when he was born, he was crying and cold and helpless. Yep. That same thing Mary did for the most powerful being in the universe. Like, like he, ex- he's a baby, baby, except anyway, the sharing of gifts it's it's almost like looking at the power difference between Jesus and them. Like, mm-hmm. like Daddy, I drew you this picture in crayon. And it looks terrible. Hang on the fridge. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing with Mary. That kind of thing with Nathaniel. Even even Jesus, mm-hmm. season one, episode three, with the kids, two yep. or three, mm-hmm. and he's carving the little lockbox. Yep. He's like, it is good. Yes. All all these moments are tied together in my mind. These oh. little like. They're fantastic, and moments. it's every single one. And we're going to get to another one here at the end because yeah. there's some powerful stuff. So this tabernacle happens, and then or the feast of the tabernacle happens. They have the meal together to start this kind of week of celebration, and then they need to travel into town the next day. And Jesus yeah. kind of calls John and Peter over, and he says, "Hey, I want to I want to take you guys in town with me tomorrow. I have a meeting. Bring Matthew." And it's one of the first times that neither of them complain about it i don't know if you yeah. noticed that we're like yeah. they're like why would matthew need to come yeah. he's like it'd be good for him you know so they bring yeah. him and i'd forgotten but they're crucifying people right outside mm. yeah, yeah, yeah the city gates of jerusalem and so jesus walks in and they just do this i thought it was very tasteful but it was very real it's like, no more than 10 seconds it's just it was just beautiful like in the most painful way to watch jesus walk by these men that are being crucified 
and then immediately go, hey, we're going to have to go through the Roman, you know, basically the Roman yeah. search here in a second. And it's like, oh. Yeah. And you wonder if those are the exact men who are going to crucify, crucify Jesus, later. Jesus later. Yeah. And uh, the would, heartbreak in his eyes as he looks at people experiencing what's going to happen to him is. It rough. was real. It was, uh, and it yeah. was done in such a subtle way too, where it wasn't like a, oh, you know, it was just a tasteful like, yeah. Oh man, he's this is probably even in the not the first time, but it's just another time, of him being reminded of what that would be like, yeah. and and then so then we have Simon the Zealot who's being kind of assigned by his order to commit a assassination yeah. of a Roman ruler during this festival so he's in town yeah let's let's talk about the zealots as an order first mm -hmm. so um the way he's explained to me in bible college is at the time of at jesus time in yeah. the first century world and in, in jerusalem and all that and um he there were four major groups mm -hmm. dealing with the same problem so israel was supposed to be god's nation yes like set god's apart. chosen people set apart and once again, they find themselves in captivity, even though it's more of a home arrest this time. I was going to say, it's not like Babylon or, you know, yeah. where they're taken. But it feels like that to mm -hmm. them, where they're not in charge. Yep. They're, so this happened to them at least four times before. You can see that people have talked about it with Daniel mm -hmm. and the four beasts or whatever, that it's been yep. Babylon and Persia, Persia and Assyria Syria. and now Rome. Yep. And, and like, they are just in captivity over and over. Um. And so that's a problem. That's not, in their mind, that's not how God's chosen people are going to fulfill God's plan for the whole world. Yes. But there are these four groups of people who are dealing with that same issue in different ways. So there's the Pharisees, like mm -hmm. uh, Shmuel and Nicodemus and whatever. I love Shmuel. Every it's time so I hard say to it. say. I know. I love it. <laughs> um, they think that uh, that... This is because of Israel's sin. Yep. Israel needs to be holy and righteous again. And when they get good enough, when they get pure enough. Then the Messiah will come. Then the Messiah will come, deliver them from the them. Romans. Yep, and purge the Romans. So what they've been doing is they have the law, God's mm. actual scripture. And then they add on, right? They add this fence around it called the oral tradition. And they mention that in here. Yep. Why, why is it not okay so for So it's the, the line before you even get close to sin. Yeah, we're going like to put an extra, extra fence around. It's so the you, warning track to yeah. sin is the way it's been explained to me. We're, we're going to beat you up for touching the fence rather than touching the yep. house. Yep. Um, and so Matthew even brings it up. Mm -hmm. Like this, the prophets or the scrolls or actually uh, mm. forbid you from picking, picking up, up your mat. He's like, and he's like, no, it's the oral John's tradition. John's like, no. It, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's how they've dealt with it. They're strict. They're, they're stodgy. They're... Rule followers and bookkeepers, but the and the Sadducees are similar, right? The Sadducees are very similar, but stronger, even even more forceful. So, the the um, instead of putting a fence around it, they cut off every vestigial thing, everything that doesn't need to be there. So they the Sadducees, just like the Pharisees, are, want purity, but they cut off everything except for the first five books of the Bible, yeah, the Torah, and they just focus so purely on that. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Other than that. No scripture exists in their minds, and I don't know about oral tradition for them. They might have it. Oh, I, they definitely follow some sort of oral tradition. I don't yeah. know if it's the same as the Pharisees yeah, I don't or know if not. It's I don't binding, know, but, but yes, they have one. They're similar. They kind of play together sometimes. Yeah, their outlook not. and eternity and what what's going to come is very I different. I think they though. both make up the Sanhedrin, which is mm -hmm. like the the Supreme Court of Judaism. Yeah, it's like the high order of. Yeah, it's like the elder board of of the yep. theologies. Anyway. Uh, and then there's the Essenes at the Qumran community. Mm -hmm. They say Israel's lost it. Like there's a bunch of fakers there. Yep. We're the true Israel. So they go up to a mountain to have their own little uh, compound, their mm. own little yeah. community. Um, and they say, we're the true Israel. We're going to just keep the law, copy the scrolls, do all our own stuff away from those sinners down there. That's where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's yep. a conversation for another day. Yep. Um, but a lot of good evidence on and and biblical manuscripts and stuff like that. And then there's the Zealots. Mm -hmm. Rome is a plague. Is yep. it cancer? Is whatever? And we will cut it out. We're yep. the surgeons. They are the the God's assassins. Instruments. Uh, Assassin's Creed, the video yep. game, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. Yep. So they are walking around as secretly as they can 
taking out the cancer with a knife. They're stabbing people. Yep. They're assassins. Yep. So Simon the Zealot should be Simon the religious assassin. Yep. Zealot just sounds like I'm all in. And if you look up Zealots and you look up the stories, they were famous for using crowded times yep. and attacking in complete in complete secret. Uh, a lot of times the things that I would read is they would they would literally come up and they would use really long, actually wide blades um, yeah. that left puncture wounds rather than slices. Yeah. And so they would actually just stab and they would know exactly where to hit a Roman soldier between their armor and yeah. they would puncture a lung or puncture whatever and then they would just keep walking. Yeah. It would be compl- it wouldn't be like a let's duel and fight. It was a complete like out surprise of nowhere attack, surprise attack. But try to keep walking so you look inconspicuous. Yes, and so that it would blend in and no one would get yeah. caught. And they just did this as much as they possibly could. Yeah. I mean, and that was just their goal. They're just like we will just make it yeah. Literally hell on earth to occupy us. Like that's what their goal was. So that yeah. they'll leave or we'll kill them all. They were zealots. They were very much guerrilla warfare. Think yeah. um think the Viet Cong yes. and Vietnam. And they just saw their position as that was worth and they're worth dying for it, or worth dying to do it. The yeah. thing I love, and I want to bring it back to what this really this intensity of the story. So you see a young boy fall out of a tree at the very beginning of this. Yeah. He turns out to be Jesse, who we find out later is the man besides this pool, beside the pool in John chapter five. Who's crippled. Who's and crippled to be and is it seemed to be paralyzed from the waist down. Yeah. And then you have his older or his younger brother that's a half brother that is Simon who sees that suffering and sees his healing as only coming when the Messiah comes. So he needs to remove Rome in order for his brother to be healed. Yeah. And so he's using his zealot philosophy as the tool, hopefully to, to, to end his brother's suffering and the nation's suffering because the Messiah won't show up unless He's invited in, and then until Rome leaves, why would the Messiah want to be yeah, there? And exactly. so there's there's this part, this intensity that Jesse, the the one that is actually paralyzed, the man at the pool, is just he thinks that Simon's been led astray, and that and he's, that he's been abandoned. And, he's, and then he's like, you you left me to do what the what the law says you shouldn't do, kill. Mm-hmm. He's like, you left me to go kill people. How is that the right thing? Yeah. And Simon's position is, I'm doing what God tells me to do. And what that he thinks is, God's what, telling him to do. Exactly. Yeah. What he thinks God's yeah, telling yeah, him yeah. to do to remove Rome so that yeah. his brother can be healed. And it it's a very emotional thing. You can tell that there's deep pain in both sides. And like you said, they build yeah. this up with letting a kid watch his friends play when he can't run, watching his friends dance, watching all this stuff happen to where he can't yeah. be a part of it. And his younger brother's trying to engage him, trying to you know get him to participate, trying to create ways that he can be a part. But there's just always this, yeah. And then there's this time lapse that is just gut wrenching mm-hmm. as Jesse tries to get in this pool for 25 years, yeah. And he's just always late, never helped. Well, he's crippled. That yes. hurts his mobility. So let let's talk about the pool. Mm-hmm. Very cool. I think artistically they did a great job oh, it's, showing it's how it's long exactly, and grueling. It, but um, so the pool, they mentioned pretty much everything you need to know in the episode. But in short, it was kind of a um, we would think of Christianity as a religion mm-hmm. and we would think of um, different, smaller, weirder mm-hmm. religious things as a cult. So we would think of like voodoo and yep. witchcraft and whatever. Mm-hmm. That's culty. We're a religion. Mm-hmm. So for them, Ju- Judaism was a religion. But there were so many things you even saw in the in the intro that his parents were doing that he was trying to solve his crippledness. Yes. And they were all cultish. Yep. They hired some witch doctor looking guy to come in and sprinkle to, something yep. on him. They paid him a lot of money and they went broke, like trying to pay different sorcerers and traveling magicians mm. and whatever to heal his legs. So now he's at the pool of Bethesda, also culty, mm. um, where... Every once in a while, water will bubble up from from mm-hmm. the bottom, and they say they think it's an angel stirring up the water right there, and whoever gets yep. to the bubbly part first gets healed. Mm-hmm. Um, Which there's no evidence that actually happened, by the yeah. way. But he's been there, like, 
he'll take anything at this point. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, drink this poison, it'll heal your legs. He'll do it. Well, and that, you know, that's an ancient site. When I did research on it, you know, there's great evidence that shows it was a pagan thing that basically they left it because it was, it had such a cultural following. It was kind of like this, this like, uh, why would we get rid of that, that pool? Like, obviously it's something really special. I really enjoyed the way when they're walking into Jerusalem and Peter's like, well, Jesus is going to teach us what this pool is all about because they have yeah. no idea scientifically or naturally what's really going on. And they're like, you're going to tell he's us, gonna teach us why it works. <laughs> exactly. Which and, it doesn't. Which it doesn't. And Jesus even says that. And well, and the, the whole idea is like, they don't know why it's bubbles up every now and then. They yeah. have no idea why the water Matthew, stirs. Matthew, the smart guy, but, doesn't know. Exactly. Yeah. And Jesus is like, someday somebody's going to learn it and they'll tell everybody. You yeah. know, and it's like, and I'm like, we're in that everybody. We're, we're like, yeah, well, yeah, what is it? It's a release of gases in the in the lower court and what guess what it causes the water to heat and then it causes yeah. well, i i grew up in arizona we have amazing place just north called sedona that has a lot of high mineral high um natural springs that have this really large uh, amount of minerals in it that have a mm-hmm. healing type quality that people like to go and sit in those pools and they have this culture that's grown up all, all around that it's like a naturalistic uh, kind of healing um you know yeah. environment that's that's kind of sprung up around there um and yeah. it really has this kind of uh, cultural falling that everybody knows that when you go up there there's oils and and uh, herbs and just lots of things that are around you know yeah. what the earth can provide uh, if you use it right and not that i'm trying to like draw lines of like essential oils is terrible but i'm just like <laughs> you know it's one of those like things yeah. where it's a cultural thing and you can tell Peter and John and, and Matthew knew exactly what they were talking about. Like they weren't like, yeah. "What pool are you? Uh, yeah. What are you discussing?" Never you know? heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah knew they knew what it was. You know. Yeah. So, I mean, let's get to the let's get to the meat and bones. Jesus doesn't tell them who they what they're going to do. He just says there's a meeting, right? Yeah. So they come in, and who should be at the pool, but the Pharisees? Yeah. Specifically, the guy who is with Shmuel, Shmuel, Shmuel's Shmuel. teacher or whatever. Yeah, and Jesus like comes into the pool and he and he just the courtyard of the pool and he does this great thing where he scans the room, he scans the courtyard, and he goes, "That's him, the sad one." Yeah, he's the one that's been here the longest. Yeah, and then he walks up to him, and uh, I don't know if you noticed this. It was a really powerful moment for me when I watched it. So Jesus asks him a question. He says, "Do you want to be healed?" And then Jesse basically breaks into all of his excuses. Yeah. Right? Just like, no one will help me. I can't get into the water. I, I don't even want to try anymore. Like, there's yeah. no hope, you know? And then Jesus keeps coming back to, like, you don't need the pool. You need something else. You need me. Yeah. Do you want to be healed? And. I love it because right when he kind of doesn't even say yes, right? He kind of gives him like a nod slash whatever. And right when he does that, did you see what John did? Wrote it down. He wrote it down. He like immediately pulled his book out and he's like, I got to write this down. I got to get all this. And he's the only gospel that records it. Really? Yes. Okay. Peter and John are, or Peter and Matthew are both there, but neither of them write anything down. He's the only one that writes it down. Yeah. And so he's the only one that we have it in. That's so funny. So (laughs) there are four gospel accounts Mm -hmm. in the Bible. Yes. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew is Mm -hmm. Matthew the tax collector. Yep. Mark is a guy you see later in the book of Acts, but it's asserted that he was close to Peter. I think you see that in Acts 2. Yeah. Um, Not Acts 2, but Acts as well. And Mm. uh, so they think that it's the gospel according to Peter written down by by Mark. Mark. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the Gospel of Luke, not a disciple at this point, and then John. So Matthew, Peter, Mark, and John are all All here. there. Yeah. So they're all gospel writers. But but only John writes only it down. Only John writes it down, which I find it was just kind of a fun way yeah. of being like they probably were yeah. there. John's the only one that was like, Oh snap. I was like, like Matthew, what are you doing? <laughs> yes. Well it, it was a it was a beautiful thing too, where like I I love the way that it went down. So like, of course there's this beautiful moment where Jesse starts to feel in his legs. He stands up, slaps his thigh, slapped his thigh. Did he go like, I feel that. 
Yeah. You know, it's a, there's a great book called The Blessing of Pain, which anybody ever wants to read. It's about a guy that was with a leopard colony mm-hmm. in uh, the Middle East that longed for his people to feel pain because it meant there was life. Oh. And it was, oh, so good. Anyway, it's a yeah. really good book. Anyway, so that was what my mind went to immediately. It was like he felt that slap and he was like, I'm alive. So oh, he stands yeah. up. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he stands up and he meets eyes with, Je- with Jesus and there's this like just laughter and, yeah. and crying and he walks away and he's like hey have a great day see ya doesn't tell Jesus him Jesus skips town as fast he I mean, doesn't not tell town, him his like, name he doesn't do anything he leaves so quick so he doesn't tell him I feel like maybe maybe they did that because like everybody else is there looking for healing too mm-hmm. Jesus isn't here to heal everybody at this exact moment but he does it for one yep um Partly to show how much better he is than this pool. What do you think of Peter's words? Were uh, they freaking awesome? S- he said something that this changes everything at the end. So he picks up his mat. Because you won't need it he- here anymore. You're you not know- going to stay here anymore. You're like, why yeah. would he want me to do this? He's like, because you're not going to stay here anymore. This yeah. changes everything. He's been there for 25 years. He's been there for 25 years. Oh, dude. Yeah. And, and then watching the guy, you know, Shamul's teacher, Ooh. like, freak out because yeah. of the oral tradition yep. that you are not supposed to move an object from one place or the other during Shabbat. Like it is not allowed on, on, yeah. you know, on the Sabbath. And so they're watching him pick up his mat and they're ignoring the fact that he was healed after 25 years. And they're only angry that he's holding that he's breaking he's their not, law, not God's you, law. John, John, the like, above, did you see what he's he did? like so mad. Like he's yeah. like, are you blind? Like, <laughs> like he's just so mad. Yeah. And uh, it's just a brilliant scene. So cool. And Peter's reaction is so yeah. like the woman at the well where they're coming out of the city. And Peter's like, thank you, Jesus, for letting me see that. That was yeah. amazing. And then Matthew has his line. And I thought it was so cool because that's yeah. why he brought Matthew and neither of the other two realized it. And Matthew's like, why didn't you wait 12 minutes? This is his line. Why did he wait 30 minutes to do it on Shabbat? You could have avoided so much, whatever. And Jesus said, sometimes you have to stir up the water. Pull it Bethesda. No. He's the angel. Kabow! Now you drop, dude. I was oh like, my gosh. Oh. I just, the only thing that could have made that better, some explosion behind Jesus. He puts on some aviators. Like... Dude, but they did it because he Killed turns it. his back on his disciples and then he gets this like like smirk, smirk oh, like, oh, dude, we're Killed about to. Me. It was, it's by far the best ending of an episode. Yeah. And I, they have t-shirts and everything and coffee mugs with that on, by the way. Sometimes you just have really? to stir up the water. Uh-huh. Yeah. They have their, all their merch because that line just. I did look through it, it the other day. It hits. Yeah. Anyway, that was by far my favorite episode. So good. It it it's one of those. I think it's in my top three. I don't know if it's by far the best way that ends. As a whole, watching JC and Simon then then meet up after he's healed and the scene of just this yeah. absolute joy. One thing I loved was at the beginning of the episode in that whole intro with Jesse breaking his legs and being paralyzed and whatever. So he's like missing out on a lot of stuff. Um, he even watches his mom die while giving birth through a little curtain because he can't go in there. He yep. can't get up and walk in there. Yep. He, he'll do that or he'll drag himself in there. And so there's this whole scene where finally his dad's marrying um, this other woman after his mom's died. And so this is his stepmom, his step family. They're all doing this wedding dance that you've seen at the wedding at Cana, that yep. whole part. And they're all doing this dance and then they come around and invite him in. Basically, by moving, they're dancing in a circle. They move their circle to include him. Yep. So he's sitting on the ground, and they're, like, dancing, whatever. So the first thing, when he turns around and sees Simon the Zealot, yep. when Jesse sees him, he does a little jig. Yep. I love and it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> my poor heart. It was It was such a brother thing, too. Yeah. It felt like a brother moment. It felt like like every time... Yeah, me and my brother would go try on clothes. My mom would take us. We'd come out in that pair of pants and just like lunge as deep Dude. as possible for no reason. <laughs> for no reason. Like it we're just, not accomplishing. It anything. was this this joy beyond description. Yeah. It's not happy. It's joy. They've both of them have devoted their whole adult life to trying to fix his legs. It was so good. And they had just finished a scripture 
when they met that he would know, Jesse said, and Simon said, they would know the Messiah was here. Yeah. When he could walk again. It's It was in the scripture, the Zephaniah one, and hmm. it was in uh, Simon's note to Jesse when he got up and yep. left in the middle of the night. I'll know the Messiah comes back when you're standing on your own two feet. He's quoting that Zephaniah, but kind of in his paraphrasing it in his own way. Yep. Um, it's, which it's, was great, really beautiful, just like what Eugene Peterson did with the message. And it's um, also a beautiful thing, just like with Mary, where yeah. Mary uh, Magdalene in the very yeah. first episode has that scripture that Jesus uses as kind of a tie-in. It, it, yeah. just, it was just so, so powerful. Good. Here's what I'll say. If you haven't started The Chosen, and I don't know why you're listening right now if you haven't yeah. watched this episode. If you are if you haven't watched it you're breaking the oral tradition right now bring someone else in too that's the yeah. other thing yeah, bring yeah. other people in i think they would be really blessed to watch some of this stuff and i don't mean that in like the christianese i really mean this and like these are wholesome fun incredibly uplifting things that we but also want. artistic and yes. deep yes and they're really well done yeah that's the thing that i'm always impressed um listening to dallas jenkins talk about the the director and, and kind of writer yeah. of this and how hard they're working to not just let these be just you know random or, or semi good. They're they're trying to put everything they can into making the best yeah. they can. And I feel like the scripts, the 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 screenplays, uh, the actors, um, everything, lighting, production, sound, they are high quality stuff. And yeah. it's it's definitely some of the best and most engaging Bible type things yeah. I've ever seen. Seriously, don't don't. I mean, you can. It's fine, but don't watch it because it's wholesome. Watch it. Because it's deep and artistic and powerful it in the really same is. way that like don't drink coffee, mm -hmm. black coffee, because it's one calorie per cup. Drink it because it's good. Yes. Don't eat a snack because it's zero <laughs> calories. Eat it because it's like some complex, delicious flavor and texture. <laughs> yeah. That's why you should watch The bread. Chosen. It's bread. Yeah. <laughs> if hey, it's low calorie, it's in. Thanks okay. so much for listening to us ramble on forever about yeah. this. Probably our favorite episode. I'm not yeah, going to lie. I think seriously. this is probably our favorite. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to click the subscribe button, that way you don't miss uh, upcoming podcasts that release on Thursday, a wide range of topics, including our values and vision right now, yeah. and or the next chosen episode, which comes out next Tuesday. Um, as we continue our journey, at, you know, basically, hopefully marching on to where we're actually caught up completely and we're watching new episodes with you yeah. uh, as they come out, which would be ultimately the fun thing to do. So, hey. Uh, click the like button if you enjoyed this video, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Have a great and glorious day in the Lord. See you later. See you.